Hey, it's Victory, and you're watching Gospel Music Buzz. Be sure to check out our latest interview. Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your presence. We invite your presence here in our conversation. Lord, let it be uh, seasoned with salt so that it's effective and fruitful for everyone that listens and that uh, there will be seeds of faith sown in every heart. Um, and Lord, would you take this interview far and wide so, so that your kingdom is expanded far and wide. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to represent you and to be vessels of your very spirit. Uh, we love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are back with another episode of The Buzz. I'm your host, Sherwin, with Gospel Music Buzz. And today we're joined by Grammy Award winning Rock Nation singer, songwriter, and all things else, Victory Boyd. Victory, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Sherwin. Of course, of course. I think the last time we spoke, it was probably a few days after the Stella Award. So definitely... Yes. You know, we're back in, in, you know, Stella Award season again. They're starting nominations and all that, you know, the submissions and all that. But when we spoke then, you know, you had a whole lot that was lined up for the year. <laughs> and now that, you know, you did your tour as well, then you were on tour with uh, Lauren Daigle. Mm -hmm. You guys were on tour and there's so much that happened in between yeah. that time frame. So how are you feeling now? Let's kind of just start <laughs> with that. How are you feeling? I feel great, you know. I'm really thankful. Uh, I'm I'm just thankful for how the Lord has been positioning me um, in music. Uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to freely express myself mm. and be granted various platforms across various genres, you know, because uh, I think that we struggle with that as artists a lot of times, mm -hmm. um, wondering, well... Do I have to compromise who I am in order to get a platform? Or am I able to be fully everything that I am and be given an opportunity on major platforms? And, you know, it might be a longer route mm -hmm. when you stay true to yourself, um, but it's totally worth it. And I feel like I'm in this season now where um, I'm able to be all things, I'm able to be the black Christian soulful folk uh -huh. jazz, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, like every kind of thing that is just who I am and, and, um, and be on every kind of stage. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm just thankful. You know, <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad you sort of led with that, right? Mm -hmm. Because that now, kind of takes me into the space now by just thinking of the, of the, you know, the reverse to that, right? Because a lot of times when, and I, and I you know, you, I'm going to have you touch on a little bit, just, you know, how you even, you know, the label you're on and being signed. But you mentioned the word being free. A lot of times the stigma is when you're assigned to a label, that freedom is pretty much chaperoned. That freedom, that creativity, if you may, is stifled. It's, hey, this is what's hot today and this is what we're doing or here's what we think you should do. Right. But to be able to be in that season where, yes, you're on a major label and you're able to, you know, leverage a lot of resources, but you're still authentically victory. Hmm. And you talk about taking the time just to, you know, doing it right and getting there and not taking any shortcuts and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure when you were going through that season and taking the time, you probably felt like, hey, this is probably not taking fast enough. Maybe I want to give up. Maybe like, what were some of those moments looking back as you were, you know, processing on that journey? Yeah, well, giving up has never been an option for me. But I can't say that there haven't been moments where um I felt really close to the edge. It's, for me, it's like there's, it's, <laughs> it's like the best artists are the ones that are like, I'm going to express myself freely or die trying. Mm. It's, but I'm not going to give up. 
You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's not an option. I'll either, <laughs> it's either, it's either I become successful or I, or I, or I die trying or I just die a free, <laughs> a free, um, artist that yeah. is fully expressing everything. And some artists do die without, mm-hmm. I mean, just think of Vincent Van Gogh. Mm. He was not famous. Yeah, until after, yeah. Until after he died. But he was free, you know? That's true. He wasn't successful, Mm -hmm. but he was free. You know, and so, like, most, I believe everyone's born an artist, but not everyone is that determined to be an artist, to be the artist that they were born as, Mm. you know? And so the ones that are determined to be free are the ones that in the end change the world whether it's they're changing the world while they are alive Mm -hmm. or or their work is changing the world after they're gone but you know so for me there have been many um seasons where i was close to the edge you know where things are not adding up you know but i'm committed to my calling and um you know and I think I have to give Rock Nation a lot of credit. Yeah. I mean, all the credit goes to God, but God, like... Uses vessels, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Because, like, um, you know, with Rock Nation being founded by Jay-Z mm-hmm. uh, and Dame Dash, but, the, like, these these are some of the founders of a, of a genre. When they started out, like nobody wanted to take a chance on yeah, hip hop. Yeah. It, mm-hmm. it was not considered real music. Correct. It was considered, uh, you know, just like it, it just was not respected. Mm-hmm. And so they had to believe in themselves, and they had to find their own resources. They, they had, had to foster that free thinking as exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah. They had to cut corners and make stuff happen, um, and not wait for people to support them. And so, even though hip hop is a very different um well I, I should say the way that hip hop started is mm-hmm. a very different message than what I'm doing. The concept is very similar in that um there's not a lot of precedent for an artist like me where I am a singer songwriter folk soul artist that sings jazz but also sings gospel but also wrote hip hop records for Kanye and like <laughs> <laughs> I mean <laughs> okay and then wants to come out with a gospel album and now is like at the stellar awards but like <laughs> you know like <laughs> When but then goes on tour way. with Lauren Daigle <laughs> and his Christian Wh- contemporary. Which is completely CCM. <laughs> <And> so when you... <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah. that that definitely... When you phrase it that way, I think, yeah, th- we're not seeing a lot of that. Let, no, let's I just mean, start. Yeah. So it's like... And then, and then I mean... And I, I had feedback from people, like, oh, you should go... R&B, you need to come out with a clear, strong, black R&B record. And don't get me wrong, I ha- I don't have a problem with singing rhythm and blues. Because mm-hmm. for me, it's about the spirit behind the music. Yeah, It can sound like rhythm and blues just as long as it's edifying, mm-hmm. you know, in the content. Um, but it's an honor to sing the gospel of Jesus yeah. Christ. It's not a liability. You know, uh, I shouldn't have to make a creative decision on what music I make based off of um, based off of societal pressure of what I'm mm-hmm. supposed to do as a black woman, as a black artist. Yeah. You know, like... Or what I'm supposed to do for record sales. Although I understand that one might put that pressure on me if they're the ones that's putting the money up and of all course, the things. Yeah. And so that's why I give credit to Rock Nation because they took a chance mm-hmm. and trusted me and 
they trusted me as I trusted God. Mm, I love that. You know, and I'm like, I don't know how this album, Glory Hour, is going to go down. You mm-hmm. know, because it sound it doesn't sound like your average gospel album. Of course, it's yeah. it's it's unique in many facets, um, and even if it did, Rock Nation doesn't have the ends of how to sell gospel music because they've never done it before. You know, yeah, so it's yeah. like so it's a whole new it's, yeah. It's a new frontier. But if anybody understands creating a new thing, it's this label is a pioneer of an entirely new genre, which, which was hip hop at the time mm-hmm. or Rockefeller records at least. And so that's where the similarities come from. I think, I think God set me up this way. Um, I mean, of course we all made decisions to be in a partnership like this, but I think the the way that I got this opportunity was divine because I don't think that I would have this much freedom in a Christian label. Yeah. Like, I'd, yeah, because then I would be stuck in only, like, it has to be the next worship hit. Like, Co- it has to correct. be the next. Yeah, yeah, because then there's, <laughs> you know? there's different things. Yeah. Right, and it's like, how do you, how do you, it's not authentic if you're, you know, if you're s- setting out to make the next worship top Billboard 100, <laughs> you know, but, but even even with with that, right? Because like I went to a bunch of listening parties and such, and a lot of times you've heard for some of the the you know individuals that maybe signed the label. A lot of times when they have told their stories, they're like, "Hey, man, you know, when this label first signed me." they really didn't know what to do with my style of music. So I basically sat on the side for five years. I sat on the side for X amount of years while they were trying to figure out. And I had to keep proving myself like, no, this is what I'm called to do. This is what I should do. This style is going to catch on. Like if we looked at artists like Jonathan McReynolds, we look at artists like Doe, we look at certain type of artists it takes a while that for that sometimes for that to break through. And once they caught on, then everyone is going to run with it. But at first, when some of those artists first come through, everyone is just like, what's what's happening, right? Like, this is this is different. This is, you know. But when you started to talk about the, you know, your Rock Nation story and just even being signed for anyone that might not be familiar with how that even came about. So, you know, just recap a little bit, like, how did you even arrive at Rock Nation? You know, you're this independent artist, you're doing your thing, you know, starting from there. And then now you're you're at Rock Nation and you're performing <laughs> at, you know, at the sunset hour on top of Rock Nation <laughs> <laughs> rooftop. Like, how, how did all that came to be? Yeah, well, so my family, we would we grew up singing together mm-hmm. our whole lives. I started singing when I was four, and I have eight siblings, we all oh, grew up singing. Okay. Yep, mm-hmm. yep. And um, so we we started singing in Michigan, in Detroit, where okay. we're originally from. And my parents started a community choir there, and um, and so that's where we got our start. And then we moved to the New York area. Well, we started visiting and frequenting the New York area to. Um, raise money for our choir and music camp okay. in Michigan. So we would come back and forth on the weekend sometimes and just do what is called busking. Mm-hmm. And uh, we would sing Love that in, word, in Times busking. Square. <laughs> yeah, busking, that's like when you see someone on a street corner sharing their art form, Got sharing it. their music, and they collect tips. Mm-hmm. And so we did that as a family. We were singing in like four and five part harmony. We first came and set and and set up in front of the Apollo Theater. Really? In, yeah, in two thousand and six, mm. and uh, and that was the year James Brown died. Ah, and, like, okay. People were yeah, coming to yeah. the Apollo Theater to yeah, see his body. Flowers now, yeah. Exactly. So that was like our first real trip to New York, and mm. um, and then we we did we made like a considerable amount of money on that trip and so that became like our economic system to support our our um, artistic development as a as a family of 11 because our yeah. two parents 
And so from 2006 to 2016, we graced the streets and the subways of New York City, 10 years, um, with our sound. Mm. And, and in 2016, that's when Jay-Z got, got wind of me. I, there was somewhere along those 10 years that I started to sing as a, as a solo artist. I would just venture off sometimes and go make extra cash singing, mm -hmm. like by myself <laughs> and in a different part of the park or, you know, make, make a little extra cash. Um, so I started growing as a solo artist. I wasn't officially a solo artist yeah. until we got signed. And someone sent a video of me singing in Central Park to Jay. And he was wow. like, who is this girl? <laughs> <laughs> I was singing, birds flying high, you know how I feel. I was singing that in the park. Mm. And um, actually, it was the guy, James Samuel, I don't know. He just did this film called The Book of Clarence. Yeah, yeah, I actually interviewed him. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 really great guy. Yeah, James. Yes, mm -hmm. James is the one that, really? that connected wow. me with Jay. Yeah, so really, J James discovered me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, that that's an amazing, amazing story. Because even if you were talking about it, ten years, you know, busking and you know, performing here, performing there, I'm sure you've ran into some craziness. I'm sure there's just a lot of stories that probably came out of those moments where you probably just had to pack up stuff and just leave <laughs> really quick. Like, just share any one of those with us. What, which one of those moments would you say start to stuck out? Because 10 years is a long time. I'm just taking the subway and I'm running into craziness all the time. So. I'm trying to think of the most appropriate one. <laughs> The most appropriate. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh, there are some horror ones, like freak, like just. J just out there. Yeah, just out there. <laughs> <laughs> As you're laughing, you're probably like <laughs> recollecting. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. But um, I mean, it, it's, it's probably all consistently related to people that are mentally ill and, mm -hmm. and that, you know, just are having a moment. Like. The openness and, pop. And, and, you know, and as you, we were talking, because you you guys have performed at 42nd Street, Grand Central, well, not Grand, Port Authority, you guys performed at Port Authority, below that big stairs there before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm almost sure I've seen you guys out Probably. there. Like, there's just nothing that say that I that, that didn't happen. But it's just, you know, that also sort of goes back to following your path, right? Because I'm sure there's no way that you would have thought while you're there in Grand Central Station playing or in Central Park, someone is going to pass by and they're going to record it and they're going to send it to Jay-Z. And then, like, no, the, I think just to <laughs> conceive <laughs> such a thought, it may just seem like, man, I don't know if that's going to happen. But as all of this is playing out and now you're here, you're assigned. But you mentioned before, you know, having, you know, growing up in a large family, mm -hmm. you know, eight other siblings, you know, I'm sure there is, benefits of being in a large family but there's also character building moments of being in a large family like just talk a little bit about just upbringing in such a large family yeah well both of those are benefits you know the character building and just you know just general benefits as well um you learn to not be selfish mm -hmm. you learn uh to not complain about frivolous things mm -hmm. Um, which can also be a liability at times too, because okay. maybe there's something that you need to complain about because it's like if you feel a pain in your leg, but you're like, eh, it's probably nothing. Um, but it's actually serious, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but you're so conditioned to, eh, I'll mm -hmm. be all right. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's something I mean, it's, it's not, like, biblical that that's a wrong thing to have. Of course. Because, I mean, I can imagine certain countries, like, people are just conditioned in that way where they there's really no space to consider certain, so, certain needs and things. But I've had to grow out of that mm. because I'm not in that same place anymore. You know, I'm not squished in a car with five people on one row and 
three people sitting on our laps. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) 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 you know, (laughs) on a 16 hour car ride, you know, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, (laughs) I can think of memories like that where that was just normal and Mm -hmm. there's no use in complaining that my foot is dead. Like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you can't move it. You know, fun, funny you mention that because I have four kids. Okay. And our our vehicle is, it's large, but it's not as large. Like, it's not, you know, it's not like a major suburban or something mm-hmm. like that. And then, you know, my kids are growing. They're tall. You know, I have teenagers. I have a 21-year-old and so forth. So, like, if we have to go somewhere far, the first thing they're looking, they're like, are we going to rent another vehicle? Because they, they've also gone through that. Granted, it's not nine. It's only, you know, <laughs> four and us. So, you know, they've experienced their version mm-hmm. of that. But imagine adding, doubling that number. I conceivably in my head, I'm like. Three, three <laughs> sitting in the trunk with the luggage. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, okay, make, make sense. So, you see, no, it, it, it has definitely built up a lot of grids. So, exactly. there, 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 there you go. And well, I just want to say mm-hmm. this, though, because it's important just because you can take it doesn't mean you should, you know. So that's something I, I really had to grow out of. And I'm still growing because just because you have a large capacity to take a lot of a lot of negative things, you know, uh, and I, I think I think just generationally as black people mm. this is this is something that we have learned to um this is a way we've learned a way of life we've learned because we don't know that we don't have to accept you know mm-hmm. an inconvenient life and we should just be grateful which we should always be grateful mm-hmm. no matter what the of circumstances course. however that's why I wrote that song, I Don't Have to Pretend. You know, because mm. we're used to being complacent with having needs and still saying, oh, I'm just so thankful. And I'm just, you know, praise the Lord. <laughs> but God is like, you don't have to live with those needs. Confess them and watch. Feel them. Watch and see how I will meet your needs. Like, but it's just so common that we don't even know, like the, the, it's a foreign concept to be whole. Like we think we're living in a whole state of being, um, because we wouldn't dare acknowledge our deficits because if we do, what, what will happen if our deficits go unanswered? And that's even worse. Like, it's better to pretend like you don't have deficits than to acknowledge them and then be rejected in your place of need. Mm. And so the Lord wants to challenge us to reveal our needs to him and watch how he will He will meet us and not just satisfy our needs, but but overflow, you know, create a surplus where there used to be a deficit, you know. You know, I I, I believe that. and <clears throat> But I, I think, too, even growing up, because growing up in church, I've always grown up in church. Not saying I was a Christian all my life, but I've always grown up like, you know, my grandfather on both sides of my family were pastors. They both, mm. you know, my mother and all that just kind of grew up within there, but, you know, coming from a third world country, I'm from Guyana in South America, mm. you've often a kind poverty or lack thereof as like a badge of honor when you're mm. thinking of holiness. Mm. You're like, you know, you know, I'm going to serve him, but it's okay. I don't have this. I may not have a pair of shoes to wear, but I'm, you know, I'm going to this. And you, you sort of like, and I, I like what you said that, you know, transitioning out of that space. Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's not something that you, as you progress and as you expand your faith and as God continued to bless you and continue to enlarge your territory, is also just, you know, not living in that space where you now say, when this next thing comes up, 
you know, not bringing it before him. Because a lot of time I feel as though just growing up in church at first, like you were told, thought, whether subliminally or, you know, projectedly from the, you know, from the pulpit or something that, you know, you, this is what it is. Mm. You know, you're, you're supposed to always, you know, want to do that. And then, you know, there's the scriptures I would support, you know, you know, for righteousness sake, I, you know, this happened and that happened and so forth. So I think that's a great concept to have as well. And, you know, and as, as you sort of just, just move forward and, you know, sort of, sort of move along. And then the other thing you, you mentioned when you talked about that song, you know, I don't have to pretend because I, that was one of the ones I wrote down as I was even listening to it again today. That song, mm -hmm. I want to say like, it's a song of brokenness, but it's mm -hmm. a song of like, just coming to like you, it's like a coming to realization, like, Hey, this thing that I was pretending about this thing, like, you know, like I'm here now and I can, I can lean into it. I can, you know, I don't have to pretend that I'm okay. Right. So even, you know, some of the other things, because, you know, outside of, you know, spirituality, just in life, when you're going through certain things and you're in a certain situation and just like pretend like what are some of the things you had to do to move past that to just if you mm. feel like, hey, I'm in this space where I may not be confronting something, whether or not, you know, you don't want to be confrontational or you're feeling as though, well, this is happening to everyone and it should happen to me as well, too, because. Mm you know, it's common, like, what would you say to that person or even you personally, how have you moved past that? Hmm. That's a deep question. You know, I'm still learning. Be I Like, even since writing this song, I don't have to pretend. I've learned so much more. Mm -hmm. um, because on one hand, it's not okay to rehearse your pain and trauma and, like, to just confess all the time I'm broken and I'm you know because now you're agreeing with like <laughs> <laughs> being sick and unwell and traumatized yeah. and all these things and then you're gonna live like that mm -hmm. you know and so what's the balance like how do we how do I acknowledge the fact that I am broken because that's true and how do I stand in faith without being fake you know what mm. i mean and so without being <laughs> fake yeah, yeah exactly exactly it's a, it's a complicated thing and so what i've learned is that there is who i am in the spirit mm -hmm. because of all that jesus like the paul says it's no longer i who lives but christ who lives in me mm -hmm. so now the life of christ is my life Yes. And that is the spirit version of victory. And the life of Christ in me is never weary. Mm. He's n he's never tired, he's never sick. He's never, you know, he's never broken. He's already defeated all of that. And that's the life that will live eternally. Like Christ yeah. in me, yeah. right? But then there's this other part of my life that's my flesh and is like wasting away. And sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I'm agitated. Sometimes, you know, this other part of my life is my soul. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's the spirit and there's the soul. You know, your soul can be broken sometimes. Like you're mentally ill or, you know, just oppressed. Mm -hmm. with Like all sorts of things. And so what I've learned is that it's very much possible to declare that by his stripes I am healed. Mm-hmm. Because in the spirit version of me, I am healed. But in the soul version of me, I might still be sick. And so there's a decision that I have to make. Will I agree with the reality of my soul mm -hmm. being weary and sick and broken? Or will I agree with the reality of the spirit of God in me, which is by his stripes I am healed, you know, which is I have authority over every infirmity, every, you know, d depression, like yeah. everything. And regardless of what, because sometimes that's what's faith. You have to call things that are not as of though course. they were. So mm -hmm. it, it might not be existent in the material realm, but you believe without a shadow of a doubt that you are healed in the spirit realm. And your, 
you have to make a decision to live according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. Flesh doesn't always just mean living according to sin. It can mean living according to how you feel because you feel whatever, yeah. you know. And so so this is these are things that I'm learning even now, you know, because it's true. It's important that you don't pretend with respect to your reality in the material world because that's where the miracle is going to come forth. It's like if your reality is I'm in darkness, then when the glory of God illuminates your life, it's a miracle because now I wasn't I was in darkness, now I'm in light. I was blind. Like if you're literally blind in your physical being, but and then the Lord heals you and mm -hmm. now you can see. Now it's like so you have to acknowledge the reality of what whatever deficit is there, like, oh, I'm poor, but then God made me rich. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like whatever it is. So and then on the and and so it's it's a matter of translating what is true in the spirit into being a manifested truth in your physical yeah. material situation, being yeah. and mm -hmm. situation. So <laughs> this is, this is complicated, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this is what I'm learning because, um, both are important. It's important mm -hmm. to not pretend and to acknowledge the condition of your soul, the condition of how you feel, the condition of your body, and not neglect it because you're just so caught up in God is good. <laughs> <laughs> but then on the other yeah. side, it's important to, in the face of pain, in the face of depression, yes. in the face of sickness, decree what the Jesus has done because he has already made provision for depression to be defeated. He has already made provision for infirmity to be defeated. He's That's made, right. And all of this provision is in the spirit, this in the Holy Spirit is in, you know, and so, and his Holy Spirit is in us. And so, and so it's just a matter of learning to agree with the spirit while you're still in the midst of, pain or loss or deficit or struggle and acknowledging both to be true, but acknowledging the spirit to be greater. I love that. Acknowledging the, <laughs> acknowledging the spirit to be greater. I think that's, that's, that, that, that's a powerful point. And I was also checking out your, you know, cause some of the stuff you mentioned kind of brought me back to, you know, the song you did one thing. Mm hmm and you released a new video for it. Yeah. And there were so much symbolism, so much <laughs> themes. Like there was so much that one can extrapolate from that video, even mm -hmm. starting with the little girl. <laughs> and what does the little girl mean in that video? So just let's let's get into that a little bit. So, <laughs> you know, really great creative work, you know, definitely shout out to your, you know, the producer and the you know, director and the entire team yeah. behind just bring that to life. So talk to us a little bit about that video and, you know, what, what the meaning, symbolism, but leading with the little girl in the video. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just want to shout out Dante Nelson, the, the yes, director. Yes, Dante Nelson. Yeah. Uh, this was a labor of love that he really brought to life. I gave direction in terms of, like, the concept, mm -hmm. but he went above and beyond and materialized it all. And so, so this little girl <clears throat> is the little girl version of me. Mm. She's also the little girl version of, or she's the child that represents black kids, you know, that, that have little chance in being successful in life because of the cards that they're dealt and mm -hmm. the generational um, baggage mm -hmm. that for d decades and centuries has just been passed down from generation to generation, mm -hmm. and it's like a cycle. And so what hope 
do does this girl have? What hope do these kids have? You know, and me being from Detroit, yeah, from the inner city, um, yeah. like I'm the exception. Most kids did not come anywhere close to being able to attain the a walk in this level of success. It was shot there in Detroit. No, the, okay. the, the film was shot in Florida, South Bay, okay. Florida. Got it. But um, but my story. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, you yeah. know. So, how did I make it out? How did the little girl make it out? Mm. You know, she found the one thing. Ah, okay. <laughs> she she found the one thing, and so she, she these kids end up breaking the cycle, and it's. It's like the words of David, but it's it's like the kids end up singing the words of David. It's like a, it's the one thing that I'm searching for. The one, like, mm. if I could just ask God for one thing, it's like I want to be with you every single day of my life. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know. And it's like the kids. That's how. That's their. That's their way out. Like I, I, I love that because even as you're. You're looking at it, and then you're seeing like the the transition to the ballet and the expressiveness <laughs> and stage, and then you flipping back to the next scene, mm -hmm. and then even with the with the part of, you know, you hey, can you hear me? Can you hear me? But it's also still filtering out all the noise around, just to hone in on you know on the, on the voice, you know, honing on your voice of the person that's asking, and then cutting back to the church, mm -hmm. you know, going back to the source. Like it was such a powerful. <laughs> creative like anyone that has not seen the videos yet check it out on the victories youtube one thing victory boy you you want to check that out is is you know be prepared to just sit there and just let it minister to you don't just sit there while you're on your phone and doing everything else like just <laughs> <laughs> submit for six minutes <laughs> i know it's hard it's like it's uh, i'm looking at my kids i'm like i'm talking and they're like flipping here i'm like just Give me two minutes. Just <laughs> l look right here for two <laughs> minutes. Um, but uh, I want to also back up. You you mentioned you know when you were on tour with with Lauren Daigle, mm -hmm. there was particularly one stop. I was it Sacramento. Mm. Was Sacramento? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you were transparent that you know there was a moment there when you know when you were going to share and then you were looking around at this pack theater, you're looking at the audience, you're looking at everything and you're thinking, maybe this is quite not, this is not quite the place to, for me to share my story or maybe not. But then you went ahead anyway and you were transparent in that moment and you guys connected and you guys sang the other song right after, you know, but what for anyone that may not have been there or may not have even heard the story like just kind of talk a little bit about that moment and what that moment meant even for you yeah well <laughs> <laughs> you know i i love how you take a pause you're like hmm, well <laughs> Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> well, you know let me just say this in in my field of work there are a lot of exhilarating high <laughs> moments, you know, like in an arena. This is an arena, not a theater. So yeah, probably yeah. like 15,000 people, mm -hmm. like, you know, standing on stage with the probably the number one Christian music artist. Yeah, yeah. And like, and, you know, I'm, I go through different worlds like oh i mean i just did a show at the jazz club the number one jazz club in the world the other mm -hmm. night like it's like these different heights where um when when you're when you're in these spaces uh it's a ch it's a challenge you you pour yourself out you know and you expose your your life and your soul and and sometimes it's a challenge more than others and and you come you come back down to reality mm -hmm. and you're like wow did i really go there mm -hmm. <laughs> you know um but this was one of those those times when was, i just felt like 
this is a moment. Give it all you got, you know. Mm. And um, <laughs> so Lor- what, what happened was Lauren asked me um, this story behind my arrangement of His Eyes on the Sparrow. Okay, yeah. And Great I- arrangement, by the way. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I, um, I was thinking back what happened when I, when I make this arrangement and I, ref- I found the, the story. I found the moment. And <laughs> the moment was I was actually in jail. <laughs> mm. And um, I was sitting in a jail cell. And I was crying. And I started singing His Eyes on the Sparrow. Mm. And I started singing. I, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Wow. I wasn't happy or free, but I sang anyway. <sighs> and I, in that moment, was like, well, do I share this story in this mm. room filled with beautiful people? But this particular demographic of people probably are not accustomed to hearing stories this heavy yeah, <laughs> as like yeah. it's the normal you know mm-hmm, what I mean because mm-hmm. it's just like this is not this this audience ain't from the streets let's yeah, just be yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 let's be real it's not the case yeah um but what had happened was is I got arrested because I was singing in the subway and so mm. but it's legal yeah and it was like 10 years ago and uh the cop just accused me of panhandling Mm. And I said, "Well, no, I'm just, I'm just singing." And then he's like, "Well, in my book, this is panhandling." And then I said, like, "Oh, got it. it. What if I just put my tip jar away, pack everything up, and just sleep?" Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no. Well, I was, I was asking him if I can. Well, would it be okay for me to continue to sing if I pack up my? tip jar mm-hmm. <laughs> so basically <laughs> basically so there's no confusion on if i'm yeah. panhandling or not because i'm not even i don't even have a suggested tip mm-hmm. jar out mm-hmm. or anything like i'm just singing and then he's like you're being a smart aleck <laughs> like oh <laughs> and then he's like and i'll and and then i was like no i mean because i pulled up the law because mm-hmm. i had that ready i mean i know the law yeah, yeah cuz I mean that's what you're doing so you you yeah, yeah know that yeah. Yeah, and it's, it says that you know you're allowed to perform in the subway system as long as you don't have amplification. I don't have amplification and since I'm no longer panhandling should be fine. He's like, "You know what? Turn around and put your hands on your back." Wow. And so So yeah, I <laughs> 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 So he took me to jail right there on the spot. Wow. And I, I was so confused. I felt like my spirit was broken because, mm. and I felt like I should just do as I'm told because that's what I, like I should have just shut up. Mm-hmm. You know, if I shut up, I wouldn't be in jail. I should have just, you know, I shouldn't have never sang. Like, because if I wasn't singing, then I wouldn't be in jail. And the more I thought about that, I was like, that's so sad. Yeah. Like, it, I, it's sad that in order to make everything okay, I have to stop singing. In, mm. order, for, in order for me to be in compliance. You know, like I just was processing that deep, and mm-hmm. I said, and it was like the Holy Spirit was there with me. And he's like, well, you have two choices. You can either do as you're told mm-hmm. and shut up. Or you can sing. Mm. You can sing from here. Wow. And so I was crying, but I sang through the tears. And I sang, I sang because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. And it was a defiant song. Mm. Like, even if, even if 
singing will land me here. I'm going to still sing because he is mm. he is worthy even from here. My God, you know, and I never really told that story before. Mm. Like my own team never heard that story before. Wow. And so when Lauren asked me on stage in a room filled with mostly white Christians, uh, I thought to myself, do you really want to know the story? <laughs> Dude, am I going to sing a, a redacted version of that story? <laughs> do I brush over the details or do I steady the course? Wow. <laughs> mm. But then I felt like to not tell the story would be to deny not just Lauren, but this group of people yeah. the opportunity to really accept me. Because mm. I felt like it's not about accepting me. It's about accepting each other as Christians. Yes. You know, because there's... There's a reason why black Christians and white Christians, for the most part, it's not the norm to worship together. You know, it's mm -hmm. like this is that industry and this is this industry. And Correct. It's not, yeah. You I mean, know. even in subcultures in the in, in the Grammys when it's nomination, oh, yeah. like you, you clearly see as you're going through the categories like, OK, this is gospel. This is Christian music, mm -hmm. Christian contemporary, different subgenres. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of times this we deny each other this place of vulnerability with each other. And we just, you know, for her to give me an opportunity to share, first of all, for her to ask my story. Mm. That's a that's a big deal, you know. Yeah. Um and I should ask her story, you yeah. know. It's not it's not one-sided. It's like and then but when someone asks your story, do you dare actually tell it? Mm. <laughs> or do you, <laughs> or you get, this is what you can handle. You can yeah, handle yeah, this yeah, version. Yeah, this life. is what you decide. <laughs> now, now you're chaperoning what you think the person's capacity is. Yeah. Exactly. And I was like, well, that would be a dis... I'm literally thinking through all of these things on stage as... In front of 15,000 <laughs> plus people. <laughs> Like in that split moment, uh, and then was, like you see like the wheel just like <laughs> my heart is like this is like a high a really high moment, mm -hmm. like this ex like do I dare cross that line? Wow. And I and the Holy Spirit helped me to be brave because I didn't know how it was going to be received because maybe they're like, well, you should have been locked up because you should do everything the cops say. That's what mm -hmm. like <laughs> you know what I mean like. I didn't know how people would yeah, <laughs> respond. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, th thank you for re for rehashing because I've never heard that either, and I wasn't even sure what the story was. I just know you talked about the moment, but you know, again, so thank you even for being, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and talking about it as well too. Yeah. Wow. So and and you, you know, you you mentioned something else too when you were talking about when you guys first came to uh you know first came to new york and you were performing in front of the apollo you were actually going back to the apollo and this time you're not outside performing you're on the inside hey so, there that's so, <laughs> hey now <laughs> come on now i'm not outside busking i'm inside on the stage it's a new dawn it's a new day <laughs> indeed indeed <laughs> Talk talk about what's what what is that event that's 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 coming up? Yeah, so uh, there's this ministry called Reconciliation Ministries based out of here in New York, and they uh, the pastor there has put together this event called a Love Affair with God, and this this event is curated to help people have a greater revelation of the love of God. Um, New York City is filled with a lot of lonely people. Um, people that are searching for love in all the wrong places. And even people that feel as if they know love, mm -hmm. but they still have a love deficit. Yeah. You know, and this event 
is we put this together to paint a picture through the creative arts. You know, because someone can say, Jesus loves you, right? It's like, great, thanks. Appreciate it. Got it. (laughs) Got it, exactly. (laughs) Right. But uh, when someone paints a picture Mm -hmm. of this passionate, intense love that is focused on you and that desires you and that w- has paid the ultimate price for you. You know, like painting a picture with with chords and melodies and lyrics and poetry and, you know, and so that's kind of, that's what this event is. It's, it's an artistic right. representation of God's love. Um, and not just because of, how brilliant we are as artists, but because of God's tangible presence will be there as well. And, and, and so, you know, that's what we're doing. We're doing it big at the Apollo theater. That's March 16th. Yes. March March 16th. 16th. So you guys, you definitely want to be there. You want to get your tickets. Tickets should still be available. You want to get your tickets. You want to go ahead and do that as well. And we we're sharing it on our platform as well to, to, you know, bring about some awareness with that. Um, as we started, you know, shift, and now we're coming up close on a little bit on time. Um, so there's two things. One, I know you, you know, you started doing a series on YouTube called uh, Bread and Wine. Yeah. So just the name of the series and then kind of what does that outlet mean for you to just, you know, kind of carve out that space, that time, the last one you did, you were just about to go on stage. You were like an hour out from going on stage at the Blue Note, which I'm like, oh, man, we wanted to get there. I was trying to convince the wife to come to the CD. <laughs> She's like, well, there was just almost a foot of snow the day before and trying to get all that out. She just didn't feel like going to the city. Mm-hmm. But I know, you know, the the Blue Note, and you shared some little clips here and there. I'm sure that was an amazing experience. Yeah. You can talk about that as well, too. But, you know, bread and wine. What, what is bread and wine? And, you know, what can people, as they gravitate towards this series, you know, what can they expect from you just by seeing you in this different light? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> the, the Bible describes the Holy Spirit as a type of, a type of wine. Um, I, I think of, like, when in the book of Acts, where um, the apostles were in the upper room, Mm-hmm. And then suddenly the Holy Spirit came and everyone was filled. And the folks out on the street thought they were drunk. Yeah. But they weren't drunk. They were filled in the Holy with the Holy Spirit. Um, there's a scripture in Ephesians where it says, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. As if the Holy Spirit was an alternative to wine, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? And then also there's this correlation with wine with representing the blood of Jesus. When Jesus took the cup, you know, that was a cup of wine, but it was symbolic of his blood. Yeah. You know? And so the, the cup is the provision and so is the bread. The bread was symbolic of his body. body. Yeah. You know? And so both of those meanings, whether it's like, this being intoxicated with the Holy Spirit, not intoxication is not the right word because it's not like toxic is should not be associated with the holiness of God's spirit. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. <laughs> but what I mean by that is yeah. you're inhabited by his presence, mm-hmm. by his spirit, and you're not letting the faculties of your brain get mm-hmm. in the way. Because like what happens when you're drunk your, the faculties of your brain are no longer hindering you from expressing whatever you feel, whatever you, you feel you should express. So a lot of times people, they might do all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, but then on the flip side is like when you're yielding to the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. you also might do crazy stuff. You know, you might do stuff that doesn't make sense. You might say stuff that doesn't make sense Correct. to yep. your brain. Yep. You know, sense of boldness takes over. Yeah, yeah. You might start like running around the church, and you know, which as you know, yeah, yeah. Exactly. People do. You're like, hey, why is that person doing that? And you're like, you're not sure what that. You know, what I mean, so yeah. Exactly. So it's like it's it's a drunkenness in the spirit, um, and 
what I have found, and this is something that I have observed in the highest levels of the music industry, is that people leverage being intoxicated for creative purposes. So, for mm. example, songwriters will on purpose be drunk when they're writing music so that they bypass the faculties of their brain and they just do mm. whatever they whatever comes. Gotcha. You know, and so th that's why they call alcohol spirits mm. because spirits come through you. Yeah. Yeah. directly without having to be stopped by your brain and logic and reasoning, mm. you know? And so, but those are not the Holy spirit. Those are demonic spirits, you know? And so, um, a lot, but that's where people get a creative edge because they're not making music from their intellect. They're making music from a completely different realm, spirit, gotcha. spirit realm. And so as a Christian, if I want to have a competitive edge, I cannot, go and create from my intellect <laughs> and compete with people that are making music from the spirit realm. Uh, wow. I need to have fresh ideas. And I really learned this from Kanye. Not that he sat down to teach me this, but this is what I observed from working with him. It's that that creative edge, you're not, you don't get it from thinking about how can I be clever? Mm. You get it by yielding. He's brilliant. Clearly he's created the whole lot. So I think just even like, you know, with that experience with you guys working together with that too. Yeah. It's, it's like a lot of times people try too much. Mm -hmm. They're trying to make something brilliant versus yielding, you know? And so now obviously Kanye is all over the place. He'll yield to whatever spirit he feels mm -hmm. like he mm -hmm. should of the day. So that's not what I'm suggesting. But when, when you're in covenant with Jesus, you don't, you don't enter into covenant so you can have a creative edge. But having a creative edge is one of the benefits of being yes. in covenant with Jesus. Hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> you know, and so when I do this bread and wine thing, it's to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Mm. You know, and capture all of the creative brilliance that comes from the Holy Spirit through yeah. me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and then people get to to enjoy the byproduct of it. Wow. You know what I mean? And so all the songs on Glory Hour, for the most part, came through this process of spontaneously mm. fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. It's about fellowship, not uh, not art. Of course, yeah. But you get art the more you fellowship. You get the songs of heaven, and you're not trying to, like, make it, you know, you you can take it after you receive it, then you take it and through a process of development. And so yeah. that's what I did with, with Glory Hour. But the raw music, it Converted was... from that place. Yeah, from this place. And so bread and wine is like we come and sit down and just fellowship with Jesus around the table that he prepared, mm -hmm. which is the table of his body and his blood. And, and we do it through the creativity of freedom of expression w and being consumed with the with the holy spirit as if the holy spirit is a is a is a um wine that that uh causes us to appear as if we're drunk you know uh and not being afraid to appear in that way you know just yielding whatever it, not that you have to be weird on purpose like <laughs> yeah, I, I love your realness like it's it's so refreshing I, I just have to say that oh my god that no, I, I I told I totally get get what you're saying um la lastly because I know you have your guitar and I will be remiss if I don't ask you to play something, <laughs> anything before <laughs> before you leave. Okay. So we want to make sure we capitalize and at least a quick two minutes of that. But, you know, your glory hour is out, you know, it's out available everywhere. Going into this new year here, do you thinking you're going to be releasing a new project? Or are you going to continue to branch out a lot from the... I know there's a lot of visuals already out there. You're continually dropping various 
you know, visuals and videos and different, you know, components of the album? Like what some of the things you have set up for this year going into it? Yeah. Well, uh, we, we've got Glory Hour, the live album, coming out very soon. Ah, so that's going to be amazing. Beautiful. We did that in uh, Atlanta as well as in Dallas. Love and it. uh, it's just electric. So that one's coming out. Glory soon. Hour, the live album. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And then um, we have my, my next studio project we're working on now, which I'm hoping will come out end of summer, early mm. fall. And um, Ooh, yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm excited for that. That that me too. That one is designed um, to be a um, a vehicle, a tool to minister to the world. It's not. It's not designed to minister necessarily to the church. Um, Got it. It's kind of like Jesus. He had. Um, he didn't just have one ministry. He had one purpose, which was to reconcile us all to the Father. But he had one ministry to his disciples, people that already are following him. And then he had another ministry to the masses, you know, people that they're just around because they heard that he's cool and they see that he does miracles and tricks. And, <laughs> like, yeah. and so he has a message for them. And a lot of times when he's speaking to the masses, it's in parables, you know. And so, um, and when he's speaking to his 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 uh, followers, he's revealing mysteries. Oh. And so, um, so there's a different approach depending on what ministry you're sitting in. But they're both ministries, you know. Got it. And so, yeah, I'm I'm going to be sitting in both of those spaces this this year with these two projects. Well, we're super excited to see that, and you know, again, super you know, just thankful for you popping in, you know, spending some time with us, yes. going through all that we do, and just continuing to be your refreshing, authentic, just relaxed self, <laughs> unscripted. I initially. You know, came, flipped open the laptop. I had one direction I was going to go. And then I was like, you know what? Let's continue to go in this direction. I like where this is going. Forget about all of this. So let's just head in that direction. So thank you so much. Oh, you're so...